Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be solving an exponential system, a homemade exponential system. Exponential equations are fun, and exponential systems are funner. All right, we have a to the power a equals 2 to the power 2 to the power 6, and b to the power a equals 2 to the power 2 to the power 7. And we're going to be solving for a and b values. So I'll be presenting two methods, and let's start with the first one. So first of all, I'm going to write a to the power a as 2 to the power 2 to the power 6, right? And 2 to the power 6 is equal to 64, so I can basically write it as 2 to the power 64. Now, suppose a is equal to a power of 2. Why am I thinking that? Because if the base is a power of 2 and the exponent is a power of 2, hopefully we're going to come out with... Uh, power of 2. So let's go ahead and replace a with 2 to the power x and let's see what happens. 2 to the power x to the power 2 to the power x equals 2 to the power 64. And then from here we multiply the exponent so we get 2 to the power x times 2 to the power x equals 2 to the power 64 which means x times 2 to the power x is equal to 64. Great. So this is what I wanted to get. Since the bases are equal, so are the exponents. So now we're going to be looking at a function here. We're going to do a little bit of calculus, you know, looking at the increasing and decreasing uh, intervals for this function. And we're going to approach it from uh, that perspective. So the function is f of x equals x times 2 to the power x. Let's go ahead and differentiate this function using the product rule f prime, which is the first derivative, is the derivative of x, which is 1 times 2 to the power x, plus the derivative of 2 to the power x, which is 2 to the power x times ln 2, multiplied by the first function, which is x. Awesome. Now, this is factorable. Let's go ahead and factor out 2 to the power x, and we end up with 1 plus x times ln 2. And remember, when we are trying to find where this a function is increasing or decreasing, we always take the first derivative and set it equal to zero to find the critical point. So let's go ahead and set this derivative equal to zero. That gives us obviously two to the power x can never be zero for x uh, real x values. This is always greater than zero. So we are going to consider one plus x ln two being equal to zero. And this indicates x times ln 2 is equal to negative 1, which means x is equal to negative 1 over ln 2, which is approximately negative 1.44. Okay, great. So that's kind of like a, obviously 2 is less than e, therefore ln 2 is less than 1. So the reciprocal, its reciprocal is greater than 1 with the negative sign, you know, that's what happens. You get the idea, hopefully. Now let's go ahead and make a table. I know some folks are not going to be happy because I'm not using the second derivative test, but I like the first derivative test better because a table, I think, is better than taking the second derivative of a function. All right, so let's go ahead and make our table uh, with rows for x, another row for f prime, and the bottom row for f. So the critical point for my f prime is negative 1 over ln 2. Like I said, it's about negative 1.44. And uh, notice that our derivative, so if x is greater than negative 1 over ln 2, uh, the first derivative is going to be positive. Now, why is that the case? Uh, you can basically pick any number to the right of negative 1 over ln 2, like 0 or 1, and replace x with that, and you're going to notice that um, f prime is positive in, on that interval. Just the test value is good enough. So here it's positive, here it's negative, which indicates that our function is going to be decreasing and then increasing. So it's going to have a minimum point at x equals negative 1 over ln 2. Now, what is the y value for that point? We can evaluate that very easily by replacing x with negative 1 over ln 2 in f of x. And that gives us negative 1 over ln 2 multiply by 2 to the power negative 1 over ln 2 and again I did the work for you this is about negative 
five, three. Okay, it's like almost negative one half, maybe a little larger. Okay, great. So now we want to know where this function is going to equal 64. So our y value is 64. And notice that at the minima of this function, or at the minimum, the y value is pretty small compared to 64, right? So here's what the picture is going to look like. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a Desmos drawing of this. Uh, but I'm just going to do a hand drawing real quick. So our function is basically going to look like the following. Obviously, you have to consider the fact that you know, if x approaches negative infinity, uh, this guy is going to become smaller and smaller, and it's going to approach zero. While the x values stay negative, this becomes, this is always going to be positive. Therefore, the product is going to be negative. So we have a negative y value, but that approaches um, zero, uh, which means that our graph is going to stay below the x-axis uh, in the third quadrant, basically, right? So it's going to look like this, sort of. And at some point, it's going to have that, you know, uh, what is it called? The um, the minimum, right? The, it's going to have a minimum somewhere like negative uh, 1 over ln 2. And then the y value, I already told you, it's about negative 0.53. Anyways, it doesn't matter. What, what happens at 0? Well, if you replace x with 0, you're going to notice that f of 0 is 0. So it's going to go through the origin. And then it is just going to keep increasing. Obviously, as x increases... Uh, it's going to be kind of like an exponential function, but multiply by x. So it's just going to grow real fast. And that doesn't matter. That's no big deal. The idea is uh, when we intersect this with y equals 64, obviously it's not drawn to scale at all, but you get the idea. Uh, you're going to get uh, a single intersection point, which is important because we have to make sure that we only get one solution from uh, x times 2 to the power x equals 64. I know some folks uh, who are big fans of uh, Lambert uh, are still going to be mad at me because I didn't use uh, Lambert's uh, w so-called function. But anyways, so our y value is 64. Uh, we only get one x value that satisfies this. Therefore, uh, this equation has a single solution, and that happens to be what right that's what we're going to find out right now let's go ahead and find out well i'm just going to use like trial and error which you know sometimes is a good strategy so suppose um let's say okay here is what i'm trying to solve for and suppose x equals one one times to the first power doesn't work two times two to the second power doesn't work three times two to the third power three times eight doesn't work not quite there four times two to the fourth power is four times sixteen and we get a solution from here. Yay. So x equals 4 is a solution, and that is actually the only solution for this equation. But remember, it's not the answer. We were looking for a and b, and a happens to be 2 to the power x. Therefore, since x equals 4 is a solution to this equation, a becomes 2 to the power x, which is 2 to the 4th power, which is 16. So a equals 16 is a solution, and we can easily find the value of b by using the other equation, which was b to the power a equals 2 to the power 2 to the power 7, which I can write as 2 to the power 128, by the way. Now let's go ahead and replace a with 16. We get b to the power 16 equals, I mean, I said 16, but I wrote 18. That's weird, right? Anyway, b to the power 16 is equal to 2 to the power 128. Now, Remember, uh, 128 is, uh, what is that? 16 times uh, 8, right? Okay, yeah, that's what it is. So I can write this as 2 to the 8th to the power 16 and then just get rid of the 16 powers. But here's one thing you need to be careful about. When you take the 16th root of both sides, you're going to get two solutions from absolute value. So one of them is going to be b equals 2 to the power 8, which is um, 256. And the other solution is just going to be negative 2 to the power 8 equals negative 256. Because when you raise negative 2 to the 8th to the 16th power, you still get positive 2 to the power 128 because 16 is even. All right. I hope that makes sense. And let's go ahead and talk about the second method. Awesome. Now, the second method is obviously almost always shorter and a little bit more elegant. Maybe. Who knows? So second method involves the following, basically. So I have like 2 to the power 2 to the power 6. And remember, this is equal to a to the power a. So can I manipulate the base and exponent together uh, so that they're equal? 
So for example, I can take out one of the twos here and kind of split up like, you know, two to the six can be written as two times two to the fifth, two to the second times two to the fourth, so on and so forth, right? So I can do the following, two to the second, to the power two to the fifth, uh, which is going to be like four to the power 32, which is not gonna work. Or I can do two to the power, uh, two to the second, and then raise it to the two to the fourth. Now notice that here I get two to the fourth and two to the fourth, and this shows us that A is 16. Awesome, and then B is obviously easier. You already know about that. And that brings us to the end of this video. Well, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you tomorrow with another video. That's going to be a differential equation solved in three ways. And the first method is, unfortunately, a little bit painful. I'll see you tomorrow, take care. Be safe. Bye-bye.